not here with us, but he's in Toronto and he's also contributed to us thinking about payment processors and Alan's been the primary on the IADS extension. Um, I've been privileged to assist him with that, learned a lot from him. And Eileen, we all know, has done so much work on payment processors, so it's not a coincidence that we've started talking payment <laughs> processing <laughs> from around the globe and we uh, have some ideas. What we want to do today is give you a bit of the history on payment processing in CBCRAM. I think it's important that we know how we got to where we are before we decide where we want to go next. Um, current state of affairs based on some true stories, how to move onward and forward, and just a heads up, there will be absolutely no time for any questions. <laughs> okay, payment processing. I just want to start with this. Is there anything more important to so many organizations than the ability to process payments through a variety of pathways in the <coughs> Is there anything more important? Right? This is important stuff. We're not talking whether some specific feature here might work or not. This is at the core of what many organizations need to do in order to even sustain themselves. So is there anything more important? In the beginning, there was PayPal. And PayPal was written directly into core as if it was the only payment processor out there. And fair enough, at that time, it was the only payment processor out there. Um, Alan did some digging and he found Civi Space-0.8.3. And if someone's really keen, uh, let me just give him a call and he'll be happy to put that on a GitHub if you want to see the origins of the, of the PayPal payment integration. It was certainly meant to be payment processor agnostic, right? It was certainly meant to be that way. But over time, a lot of the PayPal assumptions uh, went into core, and to date, not everything has gotten refactored into PayPal-specific bits. PayPal became entangled in core. This is a grep on a 4.4. I've got 441 references. The word PayPal occurs 441 times in a CBCRM 4.4. For example, if we're on event form and we're doing something with a participant registration, we want to know if we're using PayPal on a form. So we have three flavors. Okay, so we have three flavors. PayPal Pro. So PayPal Pro, it's obviously the one that you pay more for. Um, <laughs> PayPal Pro takes in all your credit card details on the form, goes into the PHP process, PHP process interacts with the server, gets a real-time result, updates whether it's succeeded or not, and keeps going. PayPal standard, that's the off-site one. So PayPal standard, they get all the details, it creates a pending contribution, fires the user's browser off to the PayPal site. The browser may or may not come back. But if it does, or if the IPN comes back, it will update the transaction to be PayPal Express is pretty button. Mm, I think that's all I <laughs> wanted to say about that. Wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so we've got these three buckets, and I don't actually. Does anyone think those are the right metrics for billing mode and full mode? Because I don't know, and I don't find it very clear. But there's this concept of billing mode, and full mode, and notify, and direct, in in the core, which kind of denotes these two different main types, and then there's express which is special to the pretty button. <laughs> oh, and I just wanted to inject here that uh, one of the reasons why Alan and I have really gotten into payment processing for the nonprofits in Canada is because that, that is not an omission there. We cannot process American Express through PayPal Pro in Canada. You can only do that if the client has a direct contract with American Express. So most of all our organizations cannot. So for us if we have a larger nonprofit, like we have a private school, we have a political party, they will happily accept methods of payment through different types. American Express has to be able to be accepted. PayPal Pro is not even an option for us. So I just wanted to interject that. Okay, so PayPal has 
things that are about PayPal. So PayPal standard, I didn't understand this until Dave explained it quite recently, but one of the reasons that you really can't do back office offsite processing with PayPal standard or any other offsite processor, uh, so by offsite, you know, one where the browser gets redirected, is because PayPal standard doesn't really support you entering someone else's credit card details. And the reason it doesn't is because if you're logged in, you might wind up paying yourself. So, simple, we just don't support it for back office. That's, that's really a PayPal thing, there's nothing inherent about this generic concept of offsite processing that can't be back office. That's really a PayPal standard limitation. Uh, PayPal was the first recurring processor into core and then authorised.net followed shortly after. Both of them used the mechanism whereby you tell them what the recurring payment schedule is and they process it according to that. Now modern ones don't do, don't necessarily follow that pattern, um, but that's the pattern that's built into core. And that's the same thing with the IPNs, that it notifies you. Now the, the more modern ones like IATS, they will store a token in your database that you would go out to to IATS and say, hey, it's that time of the month, give me another <laughs> 20 bucks. Um, but that's not really supported in court very well. And that's because these original ones didn't care about it. So we, after PayPal, the, the next thing that happened was some more payment processes were contributed. Um, most of the ones you see there are community contributors, some were written by the core team. And that's how many were contributed before the core team said, this is getting a bit silly, and hey, by the way, people were accepting code from various people into core, and you know, we don't know the quality of this code really, we can't test it, so it doesn't really belong in core. Now this is really written just to test who's dealt with payment processes. Has anyone who runs screaming from the room now has written payment processor code? <laughs> <laughs> so um, Core decided to go another way. Let's introduce extensions. So that everything has to go in Core. Fantastic. Developers love extensions. Um, and organizations love to choose the payment processor that they want to work with. So not a surprise when the extensions framework came out, payment processor extensions were the first ones off the block. And they kept evolving, and as the framework firmed up at about 4.2, lots of payment processors um, had been written. And over the years, payment processor extensions started to do more complex things. Things that, the, yeah, more complex things, like ACH EFT, a form of direct debit, encrypted swipe, direct post, back office recurring. A lot of more complicated things were coming because organizations were looking to use their payment processors and this is what it says it can do. The current state of affairs. So let's look at what sort of payment processor extensions are out there right now and let's see how they compare to our three buckets, the basic CVCRM assumptions. These are some examples of payment processors that really, really well with the basic assumptions, PayPal Pro, and there's, there's some others that were built in, um, DPS, PayPal Express, these are kind of early ones that were built in and they fit those, those existing ones, and of course PayPal Express fits very well with the random PayPal specific <laughs> model. Fits really well though. Yeah. It might be yeah. random, but it, it's a perfect it's fit. A um, Did you want to say no, anything no, else no, about no. this one? Let's go to this list. So here's some others that are um, new types that have come in since then. Um, now the one, this, the numbers is actually the order that Karen's going to reorder them to. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So a little confusing. Start with number one. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> so offsite post and pay box is an example of offsite post. That's a French payment processor. And offsite post says, you will be redirected to enter your forms on the remote side, but you will not be redirected by a GET request. You must be redirected by a POST request. Now, CityCRM posts to the CityCRM form, not 
to the off-site form, and actually it has to store that data into there. Um, <coughs> we have implemented Paybox as part of the Obby Pay extension, and it does a sort of JavaScript redirect thing, but Core, there's, it's really pretty, there's no easy way to do that within Core. So transparent redirect is a bit like an off-site post, this is quite a popular form, and this is like, we take all your data on the first page, or we take all your data, and then we create a form with signed fields and signatures and stuff for your credit card information, and that form is posted to CyberSource. That form is not posted to your site. And once again, this is, CyberSource is implemented through the OmniPay extension, and there's quite a lot of bluffing that goes on to make the CRM accept it because we had to tell it it's a it's an off-site one to convince it to um, to convince it to create the, the pending contribution. We had to say, well, look, this is really like an off-site one, you know, you can create the pending because it's off-site. But um, in order to get it to add the billing fields to the form, we had to say, you know, it's kind of like an off-site, but it's like, not really. You know, it's kind of a bit of a mix. Um, so the cross is that it wasn't really that easy. Uh, the JS intercept, now this is the, what, what I'm calling it, client-side encryption. This is the idea that there'll be a JS script loaded onto the page. When you click on the submit button, the JS script is going to whip off, contact their site, is this what IATS does? Okay, whip off, contact their site, and get a token in exchange. And so when you click submit, what will be submitted onto your site in the credit card field is actually a token, not a credit card. So the, the credit card number never enters your PHP process. It's already been swapped out by a browser to their site request before it gets submitted. Uh, it does break the validation because it's no longer a 16 character string, uh, which is why it gets across. Fly-ins is next. Fly-ins. So fly-ins, <laughs> this is what Wikimedia use. So there's not anyone prospectively saying we want to do this in Civi at the moment, but we need to think about these sorts of examples. And they use Wikimedia, they use GlobalClick. So what happens is they fill in their form, they say, this is my country, and it goes, wow, we, you're in the Netherlands, we can offer you direct debit. And here's the form, and the form is brought in as an iframe at that point. In fact, that's not even consistently the case. Sometimes the form is brought in as metadata for the their script, and sometimes it's brought in as an iframe. But the basic point is that the what sort of payment processing you're going to get is just not known until that kind of information is available. Um, and it could be could pretty much be any one of the above or an iframe. Um, but it kind of gets calculated at the last minute. Now the the reason Wikimedia use Global Collect is a reason most of you are not lucky enough to have. You don't collect donations from every country in the world. Um, but you know, it's it's an example. And it exists. And it exists. I think five is Tokenization. Tokenization, yeah. Um, tokenization, what that means, tokenizing a credit card means um, basically the credit card information remains with the payment processor and you've got in your database a six to eight digit number letter combination and that represents that person's credit card on the actual payment, um, on your actual merchant account. Um, so examples for recurring contribution, Beanstream, IELTS payments, EWA recurring use, re tokenization. So when it's that time of the month, we, don't, we send over the token with the $20, it gets processed, it comes back yay or nay, and it's done. So all the sensitive information is stored with uh, Beanstream, with TD, or with IATS payments. Uh, it's a modern day of payment processing. And the last one we have on the slide at the very top, um, ACH, EFT, Direct Debit, IATS payments, and Moneris um, do this. Uh, for as examples, and this is by no means a complete list. We just wanted to give you some examples of what's out there. Um, uh, the way ACH Direct Debit works, um, we've gotten it implemented now for North America, for Canadian dollars, US dollars, and also for UK. So if you're processing, um, you, you get a nice pretty check because every country has their own routing number, system, combination, bank, and different method, 
So we help someone figure out what fields they need to fill out. That information, bank account number uh, and bank and transit number, is sent off to the payment processor and it is going in the queue, in the batch. And now here we're going to wait and we're every hour we're going to check in, hey, have you submitted it to the bank yet? Yeah, we've submitted it. Okay, great, it's been submitted, but well, still waiting. And it might be a couple days before, hey, there's a bank accept now. So what the way that works is it's a little scheduled job on the Yosemite Ram side that goes and checks in with IAT every hour or whichever way you want to configure that um, to see if there's been a yay or a nay on that particular recurring contribution. And at that time, we'll update it from pending into either completed or failed. Um, So CBCRM thinks it can build a form based on assumptions about the payment processor, but the assumptions are based on PayPal. So this is uh, our development workflow for writing a payment processor. <laughs> um, it looks like this. First there is this, oh no, what are we gonna do? And then it's like, no. And then it bursts out into tears. Because it, it really feels like this. Uh, we're writing a payment processor, we have to poke through these integrated PayPal and authorized net buckets to get to what we want to do. There's 441 references and we've got to find our way through there and tr through these assumptions. And we often end up doing little bug fixes in core as well to try and even make it possible. But at this day, still the IATS extension ships with a little core patch that <laughs> you want to use IATS and install this too because this is how you get around some of the assumptions. Um, for example, for 44 encrypted swipe credit card does not have 16 digits. It's a much longer encryption string. Um, so there's a little patch in 4.4, if you look at the IATS repo, um, that you'll need to install to kill that validation if you want to use encrypted swipe. Um, for that extension, because there are so many references everywhere to logic, we have um, a test matrix that is quite extensive. This is page one of only 4.4. So there's four pages like this to make sure that contributions are processed properly if they're one time, if they're on front end, back end, if they're daily, if they were for membership or if they were for recurring contributions through direct debit, etc. Every single pathway has its own logic and rules. So the only way to really know that it's working is to simply run them all um, through. And we do that diligently before every uh, release is out. But even then, I only have 21 transactions right now in pathways that are supported in the IX extension, but people will say, hey, we want to do membership recurring direct debit by our admin staff in the back office, and it cannot be done right now. It's not like we don't want to do it. It's, there's just too many, there's no way through right now to try to do that. So we're very sorry about that, but. Um, but there is a way. We, we're testing to do it as we have a public-facing form, so you want to do that. You can use the right. CID equals zero on the front end. I mean, this is a back office you mentioned. Now, right. I don't know how many of you guys know that you can add CID equals zero to the end of any contribution page. On you the can front fill end. it in as if you're someone else. Yeah. And that, if I've spoken to you about it, I probably would have recommended that approach because yeah, that's sometimes if something doesn't work back office, you could do it. You can try to find a front office. And, and CID other equals contact ID also works. Right, okay. So, but, cool, thanks. Well, it's, it's a workaround. So, another workaround for this that I actually use for a large organization is um, let's just do recurring contributions because we know that works really well. And then there's a little hook that says every time a contribution, a little post contribution hook is created, let's go calculate our own end date and plug it in the membership system. Effectively bypassing every, you know, every opportunity for something else to happen. Um, and, we, and we know, because we know that pathway works a lot better. Um, but bottom line, if, if the payment processor returns a successful, right, if the contribution status ID is one, if this was a successful completed transaction, the, the rest should <coughs> reside in court. All the subsequent logic should reside there and should be payment processor agnostic. This was successful. Do send out the receipt. Do mark the membership as completed. That's not the, the payment processor that we need to take care of that. The event registration, whether it was online or back office, doesn't matter. We're telling you it was successful. Go update it all, right? Whether it was a membership, whether it was recurring or not, whether it happened online or back office or with ACH or with direct debit, we're telling you it was successful. So go update 
the, the contribution and the membership and the event registration and send out the receipt. So in 4.6, I did make some changes. Um, these were frustration-driven rather than customer-driven. Um, and so one of the things we've been talking about before is that we, the city CRM has some things about, you know, I'm gonna build a form, you know? Am I billing mode? Am I notify mode? Am I direct mode? Am I form mode? Whichever combination of those things you find in there. Um, if I'm if I'm form mode, I think it's called, then add the uh, address field. If I'm billing mode, then don't add them, but create a, a, a temporary payment or whatever. If I happen to be authorised, I mean, yes, I support recurring transactions. So the refactoring that happened in 4.6, and this has been done, um, is that instead of trying to say, which category are you in? Hey, payment processor. Which sort of payment processor are you? We don't do that in 4.6. We say, take payment processor, Can do you support back office transactions? So let's ask the payment processor what it supports rather than try to categorize it. And these are overridable functions on the class structure. So does it support live? Like dummy payment processor doesn't. Most of them do. This does is my favorite. <laughs> Okay, does it support a future recurring start date? Paper Pro doesn't. Um, in a somewhat hacky way, it was added for authorized.net to support paper process the future start date, and that was done because one of our customers wanted it. But all of these ones that support tokens support future start dates. So they can just say, yeah, hey, yeah, look, we can do this. I rock, I support future start date. And then <laughs> the bit on the form that allows you to put the start date in pops up. Back offers. Do you support back office? <laughs> well, no, I don't because it doesn't support my type, but one day I will. Um, so we can get that. Now, get the payment form fields. This is what I was talking about with even though I'm an off site payment processor, I still need your address fields. Okay, so we allow the payment processor to say, actually, I want city, I want postal code. You know, these are the fields that I really want. Actually, I'm going to be wrong there. I think what, what that paper form feels is actually more the C, CBV and the credit card, actually, because I think the link block thing. I think the, the address ones was my, my to-do list still. I think that's we'll the, that yeah, I think the address ones are my to-do list. I'm telling you wrong. Mm, and the metadata is to give me the information to put these on the, on the form, you know, because if I get added an extra one, then I'm going to need to alter the metadata that add, that's building that form as well. Uh, payment type label, this is, so when you have your billing block, you know, it has the worst credit card details at the top, and that's where that basically goes. And then on the next one, Name. that's basically your CSV, you know, when you div, it's going to be credit on this card, so that's what those are. This is what Alan added, and it's very, very good. So this is in 4.6 to make sure we can send the long encrypted non-16 digit string as a credit card through yeah. 4.6. So you can override the validation really easily on the paper class. Yeah. Now, it's, we didn't kill singletons quite as much as that makes it sound when you see the next slide, but um, the, if you look at this, why are we telling that the payment process already and that it's live? because payment processor IDs live in the payment processor table and they have a is test field. So what's actually happening is we're getting the live payment processor ID and passing through the word test and it's going, yeah, well, it's kind of like this way. And it kind of keeps doing it throughout the code. It kind of keeps refiguring out which, you know, whether you're, so that kind of bit of information gets passed around and around. So interesting. So in, 4.6, if you're instantiating a payment processor object, the top one is my favorite way for you to instantiate a payment processor object. Uh, the other's kind of more of a backup, uh, but the get by ID is, you know, if you know the payment processor ID, just instantiate it using the payment processor ID because all this passing around in my test, that's part of the payment processor object. So surely, after all Eileen's improvements in 4.6, now we must be able to 
support these off-site hosted pay page transactions via back office, but no, no, because the, the PayPal assumption was so heavily written into core that it actually, if it gets completed, it rolls it back. This can't possibly have happened. Thanks. Yeah. A better approach, in Eileen's humble opinion. That's <laughs> so the, in the core form layer, we have this thing where the core form goes, am I, which, which category am I in? You know, am I gonna do a direct payment or am I gonna do an off-site payment? And it, it calls a different function. It calls do transfer payment or it calls do direct payment. Now you can now just call do payment. You don't, the form doesn't need to know which one is doing. The payment processor knows that. Um, but also the call is saying, if they're paying right now, then I'm not going to even create that contribution until I know it's a success. And, or, or if I do create it, then as soon as I find out it failed, I'm just going to roll it right back and get rid of it. Um, what I'm saying, and then it's got to, well, in the case of back office forms, it doesn't have any flow for offsite. But on the front office forms, it's got the the flow for the ones where it knows straight away, and the flow for the ones where it doesn't know until later. Now, what I'm saying, in my humble opinion, is that whatever's going to happen in that payment, let's just create the whole structure as a pending payment with whatever, and the one we know, we'll update it, and we don't. The form doesn't need to know if it's going to be told instantly or later. If it gets as far as a, as a contribution, as a confirm page, it doesn't actually know whether it's been completed or not. It can just have a quick check in the database. You know, it's got a database to talk to. Um, so this is my big case that we, is basically to do a bit of a rewrite um, for the and APIs and things, and basically make it so that we get rid of this double flow, this idea of what's going to, I need to know what's going to happen to my payment, before I create all the database entities. And this will be the same regardless. And this is an extra one to think about. Yeah. Why would PayLadder be any different? And could it just be another payment processor? And uh, I mean, I'll expect to talk more with Joe Murray about this, but I would have thought that if it was a payment processor, the money could wind up in an AR account by virtue of the payment process of being linked with that sort of account and it maybe would shortcut some of those holes too. Um, so that's one to kind of ponder. And I know Corin raised the issue, well, you know, with the pay later comes, you know, it's got transition types and there's all kind of complexities here. I don't understand at this stage, and maybe someone will tell me why that's any different to when someone starts off a pay bill standard and they don't finish it and they come back later and pay. I don't know why the initial intent for it to be pay later would distinguish it from one that becomes pay later by virtue of what happens. Now, one of the really strong themes for me of this CiviCon has been discovering how many people are doing really clever things to solve the same problems separately. And there's Pavias up the back there, and I'm here. Joe Murray, um, I'm not sure who else, but you know, we've all been trying to solve some of these things. And you know, it already exists, this API contribution repeat transaction. So if you're in 4.4, 4.6, not 4.5, but if you're creating a second transaction on your current payment process, instead of you having to copy base IPN or whatever class and, and create it, we've got this one thing that's or preliminary testing and it's not perfect, we can start building on it, making it better. Um, and we can really start to make that, you know, it's copying your line items, it's copying your software, so we can make that one robust instead of us, instead of, you know, each of us doing our own thing. Uh, I have created a payment token extension. Um, what that, all that really does is it creates a table in the database and a basic API to, to really, to interact with it, but it points towards all these other things that you can do with the payment tokens that, uh, as it use access. But um, I would argue that that particular one does belong in core. I know we like it being core, but I think that payment tokens is just such a core thing these days that it does belong in core. 
OmniPay. Some of you will have heard me talk about it. Um, when we talk about OmniPay, there's two things. There's an open source library of payment processor extension, or gateways, and there's about 30 <coughs> Russian gateways in there. The second thing is that there's an extension that provides a bridge. Um, and nowadays, I pretty much write all my payment processes as extensions for as like part of the OmniPay library. And the very first one I did, I found myself working, collaborating with someone. He had nothing to do with City Serum, never heard of it. He was in another part of the world. But because this is actually a library that goes far beyond City Serum, it does all the normalization, it takes you know, a standard set of fields and then translates them on a per processor basis. So I have a very small amount of integration. Um, and yeah, you, you've widened up your, your developers that you can write these things in conjunction with. Um, now I mentioned the IPNs, it, this also does process the IPNs, but what I also have discovered is that OmniPay has not gone as far as I would hope to standardize some things across the libraries, and so this Molly is one where I spent an hour getting it working for some random person in the Netherlands, but then we had this problem with the IPN where I think I finally figured out the answer, but basically the Molly library is a little bit different. So there's still quite a lot of learning on that, um, and you know, it's, it's not it's not magic, but I did magically make authorized.net work with it. I mean, I spent 20 minutes and I had a functional authorized.net to my bed. So. Without repairing. So convince her. <laughs> if you convince her, why not only pay? <laughs> yeah, so what I will say, I've said some of those reasons why I like it. Um, one of the good and bad things with it is it's really about standardization. And you can't stand, so, some of these payment processes are quite different. And some of them we're still learning about and just trying to force everything into the same standardization at this stage feels a bit premature. So I'm not saying that something like IATS would, IATS actually does have an OMP plugin, but I'm not saying that we would use it because, you know, we've been working on all these different functionality. But, but um, something like PayPal could use it, but I'm just not sure how PayPal Express fits with that. So it's, certainly there's a whole bunch of them that we can just use it with. There's others we need to learn more about. Okay, so eventually, um, this is where we visualize um, Eileen's OmniPay extension bridge in the middle, the OmniPay library, and then the OmniPay plugin. So OmniPay.offnet, um, Eileen already put together. I think OmniPay GoPay was a contribution. Somebody, the first one in. It was a random pull a request. Random pull request. request. <laughs> it's been added. It's been added. Um, and then if, if current existing uh, payment processors um, do not fit in that model, they can still remain extensions. There's nothing wrong with that. Extensions still exist. But what, what this will let us do is it will let payment processors interact with CVSRAM contribute and it, it, it can extract the logic that has now been complicating things out of the CV contribute area there, graphically represented as a layer. I know it's much more complex, but it, it's about the logic um, payment processors can still ship with core. This doesn't mean, you know, the OmniPay OffNet cannot ship with core, but if its logic is extracted out, it makes it easier for modern day payment features to be implemented. And just like I said, those ones won't necessarily fit there. They might actually have, you know, with my payment process, some of those to be their own extension, but um, if they're simple, they can, or if they follow relatively simple set of rules. Um, and I'm including some that are incredibly complex now to implement as simple in this concept. When I'm talking about the ones that are not simple, I'm not quite sure how to deal with JavaScript or extra buttons or things. That's probably more where I, you know, a basic line of JavaScript. So it's uh, not an easy task, no fun, to try and extract the embedded logic to try and go into something that, in my opinion, looks very much like Drupal Commerce. I um, just wanted to 
quickly mention it, like uh, PayPal does not ship with Drupal. Commerce doesn't even ship with Drupal. And PayPal doesn't ship with Drupal Commerce, but the, the fellow that's the head of the project of Drupal Commerce, he has a Commerce PayPal processor. And, and they're three different things. And because it is separated out, it means there's no embedded logic in here. Um, so uh, for us to write in a commerce IADS took two days and we were done. And it probably could have taken less if we weren't the first or one of the first to, to do that. And I live up in Canada and my grade five girl learned from Waterton Park officers. She spent three days with them at a field trip. Um, and then we've, we've heard the ecosystem metaphor uh, a number of times over the last months. And we know in Canada that sometimes it takes, it takes a fire to try and burn down the undergrowth to make it's beneficial and necessary to maintain health and diversity. This is literally from Parks Canada. You can look it up on the website. I did not make this up and it is in our grade five workbook. This is what is necessary. It might be really slow burning fire, but it is for a good purpose to try and, yes. So here's the museum need you, whether you're on the core team, whether you are uh, a partner, I think payment processing is important to everyone. Um, can, can, let's put it this way, can CBTRM afford not to be able to provide a framework where all these different payment methods can be implemented quickly and swiftly, because this is the latest thing and why can't we do that? Can we afford to do that? To not do that, right? To have a system where we can't be that adaptable. Because um, really, is there anything more important than payment processing? Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.